evening to everyone. We're glad to be with you. And uh, Miss uh, Karen had mentioned the hymns, the great hymns that uh, we sing, which I love them. I love the. Uh, in, in, in really, a, a really good book, if you want to get there's several volumes. You can get a book on how the hymns were written. It goes back in the stories of what people went through that caused them to write down these words. And sometimes it's incredible hymns that we just don't think about and think that there was a great story behind it. But I want to read the lyrics to a modern worship song. That I want this one that I've asked uh, Regina to to work on to do. I'd like to play it. If I could sing it, I would. But listen to these lyrics of this. This is a modern worship song. It says, "I see shattered, you see whole. I see broken, but you see beautiful. And you're helping me to believe. You're restoring me piece by piece." It says, there's nothing too dirty that you can't make worthy. You wash me in mercy. I am clean. What was dead now lives again. My heart's beating, beating inside my chest. I'm coming alive with joy and destiny because you're restoring me piece by piece. And the bridge goes, washed in the blood of your sacrifice. Your blood flowed red and made me white. My dirty rags are purified. I am clean. Isn't that good? It's a truth. It's a doctrinally sound song, isn't it? And, and so there are some good ones too. There are some good new ones too as well. Some wonderful, wonderful songs that God has given. I don't know the story. Regina said she knew the story behind that. There is a great story behind this song. So maybe she can share it with us when she, when she sings it, Lord willing. Uh, I had mentioned before uh, trying to go through the book of Romans so would you go with me to Romans and maybe with the help of the Lord for sure uh, we can try to put a uh, I just want to share a few things on, on the introduction uh, to Romans and maybe a, a, a couple things to stir your minds a little bit to think about uh, how this uh, application will will help us maybe in the days ahead. Would you pray with me, please, Father? I, I ask with all my heart that you would be glorified in this service today. Lord, we pray that you would please take this word and multiply it, Lord. Uh, we, we don't even have a, we have no strength, Lord. We have no ability within ourselves to, to convey this. We have no ability that would bring anyone any revelation, Lord, it's always, it's always from you. It's all, we have to depend on you, Lord. So we ask you, Lord, by your grace and your mercy, Holy Spirit, please illuminate our minds. Bring us to the place of understanding that we could grasp some of the depths of your word, Lord, that you would draw us nearer to you, draw us near the cross. Lord, there's hard days ahead for this, for your people, for this land. Some of your people are already going through deep, deep trials. Strengthen them, Lord. Strengthen us. Anchor us, Lord. Anchor us, we pray. Guide us, Father. We, we, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> the, uh, the introduction to the book of Romans is, is, is about the first 16 verses, actually, when you start studying the book of Romans. But found... Found in the book of Romans are some deep, wonderful theological truths that I think w will benefit us to study and learn. Let me ask you a question. Facing the days that are ahead of us, we don't know. God only knows. But how, how do you and I have the inward resources to cope with things ahead? How do we have the inward resources to to be able to withstand things that we go through. When you look at the book of Romans, I want to share with you a few things that are just, just as an introduction that are kind of shocking too, uh, to, to, to see what the church was facing uh, during this time. Rome at this time and the believers in, in 
in, in this, what we're reading here in, in the epistle of Paul to the Romans, some of this I, I, information I downloaded, uh, they, to, to live in a, one of the most corrupt societies that, that were ever known, very corrupt society. And, and it's so much, as I was reading some of these things, the immorality, it was like unreal. And, but we're seeing it today. In the upper class, it says in, in this, uh, uh, Dr. St uh, Davies said, especially among the upper class was beyond description, the immorality. Roman women uh, were said to number their years by the names of their husbands. They changed as often as they changed the calendars, the new year. I mean, it's, it's incredible. Okay. Listen at this. The political leadership merely reflected the morals of the kingdom. In the days of Paul, homosexuality, lesbianism, bisexuality, and bestiality were considered acceptable behavior. There were Roman philosophers in the first century who actually mocked a man and a woman who were married in a heterosexual, heterosexual union and, had, and was, was faithful to each other. That was mocked. Is that familiar today? It was made a mock of in this day. Perhaps the greatest tragedies were committed against children. Preborn and newborn children were at risk in the days of Paul. Abortion was commonplace and killing even the newborn baby was an acceptable way to get rid of an unwanted or sickly child. I can't fathom this. Having a brand new grandchild and looking at this baby, I can't fathom this. One Roman writer living during the first century wrote this, we in Rome slaughter a fierce ox, we strangle a mad dog, and the child who is born weak and deformed we drown without legal recourse. A Roman letter was discovered that dates to a few years before the, the ministry of Apostle Paul. It was a man uh, to his wife, and it includes these unthinkable words. I I'm almost hard to read this. To Hilary and my wife, heartiest greetings. Know that we are still even now in Alexandria. Do not worry if when all others return, I remain in Alexandria. And as soon as I receive wages, I'll send them to you. If you have our child while I'm away and it is a boy, let it live. If it is a girl, expose it and let it die. We know from history that many of these children were left outside at home at night and then picked up by child prostitution rings that raised them for their purposes. Just unbelievable. And we read this, and yet it's almost like we're reading today's news. So when we look at the, to the Romans, a man was just another animal. To act like an animal and treat each other like animals was common. In actuality, to be an animal meant better treatment. That was it today, don't we? It was, it, you, you, you can protect, you can't even kill some kind of a bird or an owl or damage an egg to, but a baby in the womb is, is in more danger, you know? And so uh, today, as in the days of Rome, life is cheap. Animals are in many ways protected more than humans. So like it says today in America, there's a legal penalty for destroying the egg of an eagle, but you can dismember a child in the womb and be protected by law. Since life is cheap and moral guideline has all but disappeared, medical ethics are now more confused than ever. This is what really, <laughs> not long ago I read of a father who was dying of kidney failure. He had a 16-year-old daughter artificially inseminated with the help of physicians. Seven months into her pregnancy, the baby was taken by C-section. Its kidneys were removed and transplanted into the father, and the infant was left to die of uremic poisoning. We have lost the definition and the value of life. Because 
And we have become more like Rome than ever before. And the more we become like Rome, the more we need the book of Romans. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to even share some of that. But I wanted your mind to get to when you look at Rome, the book of Romans, you see what was facing, the church was facing in a society that had went so far down that we are following as a nation. So when we look at it, we had already begun the first few verses, but I want to just share a couple verses with you uh, shortly. And I want to start at verse 5. because Well, I'm going to read the first, first five verses. Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through the, his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ to all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to just ask you a few questions this evening. <clears throat> in verse 5, it says, through him. Now, I'm reading of the New King James, but in the, in the King James, the original King James, I believe it says, by whom... We have received grace. Is that correct? By whom we have received grace and apostleship for the obedience to the faith among all nations. Now, I, I do like through him as well. I do like that translation in the New King James. It says, through him we have received. But I want to ask you a question. The word received is, is, the, is the Greek word lumbano. It's, it's the word lumbano. And it means this. It means to take with the hand, to lay hold of. It's found 239 times in Scripture. It means to take oneself, to claim, to seize, not to refuse or reject. So let me ask you a question. What have you received from him? What have you seized? What have you lumbanoed, if you'd have it? What have you lumbanoed? From him or through him. Now Paul says here that he said, uh, "Through him uh, we've received grace and apostleship." He was one that was sent forth. He was called by God in the most miraculous way, stricken down off of his horse. We know the story of Apostle Paul. He knows his calling and election was completely, and it just transformed him. And immediately he goes 180 degrees the other way and begins to preach the gospel that he once persecuted. So Paul had lumbanoed the calling that God had given him because the first thing out of his mouth was, what would you have me to do, Lord? You see. So let me ask you a question. If, we, if we're to face as a church, as, a, as, a, as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, you and I must lumbano or we must receive, we must seize that that is given to us. Do you not agree? We must know what our calling has. We must know what possessions we have been given in the Lord. I, I think, uh, if, you, if you will, uh, would you go uh, to Acts chapter 17? I'll just uh, go to a couple scriptures here that are familiar to you, but I just want to, to, uh, to stir up your minds. Acts 17. Somebody read verse 28. All right, so here, I want to look at the things that we have through him or in him, okay? Through him or in him. So Miss Hazel just read, in him, it's in him or through him that we live and move 
and have our being. That's one thing that we know for a certain. Everything, every, every breath that we take, every, every uh, heartbeat that we have is a gift from God. Now, let me, let me, let me tell you. Well, let me, I don't want to go there yet. I'll go to Ephesians, if you would. Ephesians chapter 1. We'll hit some of these high points. Someone read verse 7, if you would. Thank you. Thank you. So in him, here's another thing we have, which I, I really skipped number number six, which is another thing we have. We have acceptance. We have acceptance in him, through him. We have redemption through his blood. These are truths that you and I must embrace. We must lombano these truths. We must embrace these truths and have them so deeply embedded in us so when the enemy comes in like a flood, we'll be able to fight him with the truth of God's word. We, you and I have been redeemed. We have been forgiven. Now, notice in this same chapter, Paul says this. In verse 13, he says, In him you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of this glory. Now notice what Paul says. Therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. You see that? Paul says, I pray now that I know that you, you are anchored in the faith, that you're, you believe. My constant prayer is that, that the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, will give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The, the thing that sometimes gets deceptive in our walk with the Lord is our lack of knowledge of, of, of him. Knowing him, not, let me just say this, not about him, but knowing him. You can know all about him and fall all to pieces. You can literally fall all to pieces in the midst of difficulty and trials. But when you know him, when you've been given this revelation of him, that gives stability to your heart, stability to your souls. It gives us a stability that we will lack if we don't. And he goes on to say that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Do you lombano your inheritance? Do you know what you've inherited? Do you know what's yours? <laughs> Do I know? Do I know it? Do I know what I've been given? And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us to believe according to the working of his mighty power? We've been reading in our Sunday school lesson about Nebuchadnezzar who went through a period in his life where for seven years he was, if you would want to call, mentally deranged in some way that he ate grass like an ox and his hair grew out like a Bird's feathers, his eagle claws, his fingernails. For seven years, he crawled around on the, on, the, on the ground. But it was during this time and that God revealed to him what his true inheritance really was. And at the, when the Bible said, we read this morning, when he came at the end of the days, he said, I lifted my eyes to him, to him. So he realized what he'd been given He'd been given mercy one more time. He'd been, so this king, who was probably one of the most wicked and powerful kings of all time, became a preacher of righteousness, if you'd have it. He'd seen what he'd been given. 
It changed his whole life. Sometimes I think uh, if we see what we've been given, all right, go, and this is all something you know, y'all don't, this is something that's not new. Go to Colossians, just go over a little bit, please. And Brother John had taught through Colossians. I just want to go back one more time to Colossians chapter 1. Now, here's, here's another prayer that Paul, almost identical, almost in some ways identical to the church at Ephesus, he prays for the church at Colossae. Look what he says in verse 9. For this reason we also, since the day we heard it. Heard what? Your love in the Spirit. In other words, your walk with the Lord. When I heard about it, I don't cease to pray for you. I read something the other day that said, what if somebody's life depended on your prayers? It made me think, how do I pray? You know, how, how, how serious do I? We, we, we flippantly say, I'll pray for you. Yeah, I, I, I'm guilty of that. Then I thought, and, the, and the, the illustration was when Peter was in prison. The, the James, let's see, Herod killed James with a sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he took Peter also. And Peter was chained to these soldiers and in prison. No, he's going to kill him. But <laughs> prayer without ceasing was made with, of the church for Peter. And that was the question, what if Peter's life depended on you? See, what if it depended on me? So Paul is one who's praying. He said, I don't cease to pray this and ask that you may be filled. Let, notice these things. You may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Would you like that? Would you like that? Would you like to be filled with the knowledge of his will and be able to understand spiritual things? Just have an understanding and a, and a knowledge of him. Not, not, not that you'd flaunt it to people, but it's just knowing him. Knowing him. That you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him. Brother Chris read recently of Enoch who pleased the Lord. He walked with him. He walked with him. He he, he pleased the Lord by faith. And it pleased the Lord so much that he just said, I'm taking you home. I'm taking you home. Yeah, there's nothing more, Enoch, there's nothing more I can give you on this side. Nothing more. In other words, Enoch, you've, there's just a thin layer between us now. You've walked with me so much, you've walked with me, you've, and it really means talked with him. When you look at the translation, he walked with God, he talked with God, he pleased God to the point there was nothing left on earth. Can you imagine him to be so full of the Lord that he just steps right through into the most blessed, uh, I don't know how to describe it, but the Lord said, I'm taking you to me. Because I want you to experience the fullness. You talk about fullness. You know, we see through a glass darkly now. The scripture tells us we do. Even, even as much knowledge as we can attain or dig into, we still see, we still, there's no light like the light of heaven. There's no light like the light of his presence. Because David said, at, 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 at your, it's fullness of joy. In your presence is fullness of joy. Absolute satisfaction to the uttermost. No, someone sent me a text here a while back and asked me the question of, of that scripture, seeing through a glass, what, what did that really mean? And I, and I said, I, I just think we don't have the least bit of comprehension of, the, of the, what we will comprehend then. It'll be such an explosion of knowledge in our brain, in our mind, that we can't even, won't even be able to believe it. I think you just fall down. You just fall down in worship. Well, that's nothing less to do. Just worship him. The same thing as Nebuchadnezzar did. Just praise him and give him glory, you see. So Paul said, I, I, I want you to please him, being fruitful in every good work. And then, here it is again, increasing in the knowledge of God. 
strengthened with all might according to his glorious power. Now, let me look at this with me. And I promise I'm going to be done quickly, quickly. We all want to be strengthened by his glorious power. I would like that when you, when you raise your hand. For, yeah, you don't have to, but I would like that. I would like to be strengthened with all might. But I, won't, I don't want it for patience <laughs> and long suffering. But that's a continuation of it, isn't it? Look at it. Paul said, I'm praying this for you. Said, Wait a minute, Paul. Think on that prayer a minute for you. He says, I want you to be strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy. In other words, when you go through that trial that you're going through, and it seems to drag on and on and on, I'm, I want you to have such power that you're able to face it with joy. You come out on the other side joyful and, and grateful. And, and not only that, you're be given thanks to the Father who's qualified us or made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light and delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us or conveyed us into the kingdom of his dear son in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. If, if that's all we had to, and I, that's kind of a bad thing to say, but that we should never get past the rejoicing of the forgiveness of our sins. Just that, just that alone, just that, that, that absolute truth. I've been forgiven. I'm clean. Like this song. I'm clean. I'm dirt. I was dirty. I was filthy. I was dressed in my rags, but now I'm clean. Uh, now, let me just say this. There's another part of that scripture. It says there, the obedience to the faith. How do you, why does it put these two words together? Obedience to the faith. What does that mean to be obedient to the faith? We, we know that by faith, we're, we're saved. Not by works. But by faith you're saved. It, yes, it is a gift of God. But there, listen to me. <clears throat> there has to be faith worked in the heart will produce an obedience. You know the, tr the trouble with Rome? There was no obedience. You see. There was no obedience. And, and that's, that's what we're facing today. The scripture tells us in Psalms, it says the people that cast their cords. We don't want cords. Don't give us any cords. Don't give us anything to obey. We don't want to obey. Don't tell me how to live my life. Don't tell me that I can't do this or I can't do that. You see? But with true, genuine faith always comes obedience. This was shocking to me. The word obey is found 115 times in Scripture. Now, obedience is not even in the Old Testament. The word obedience. The word obedience is found only in the New Testament. But the word obey is found 115 times in the Old Testament. I mean, in Scripture, completely. 83 times in the Old Testament. 32 times in the New Testament. But notice this. It's found the most. What book would you guess it's found the most in? The word obey in the Old Testament. I'm going to look into the Old Testament. It's found 83 times, but in one book it's found the most. Jeremiah. Jeremiah. And here's the reason why. <laughs> there was such a lack of it. And when you look at Jeremiah, and it was shocking to me, Jeremiah was the prophet who preached right before the captivity. Obey, obey. You have not obeyed. You read it. Go read the whole. You can read it the whole. You can look them all up. You have not obeyed. You've not obeyed. You've not obeyed. And the scripture tells us in Chronicles, it got to the point where there was no remedy. And because it got that bad, the Lord said, Nebuchadnezzar will come in and he'll take over. And he'll desecrate the temple and you'll be carried into a foreign land. And let me ask this question before we stop. There has to be an obedience of faith. 
we are seeing a turn. I don't know if you want to call it gospel or not, but we're seeing an easy believism that is turning from obedience to belief only. And I'm not, there's a fine line here. You can't, I, I'm not trying to preach legalism. I'm not at all. I'm not. Please, I'm not trying to say a legalistic view here. But what I'm saying, we're seeing a little more and more slackness of the obedience of Scripture. And faith always leads, genuine faith always leads to, is, can I say it this way? Genuine faith produces it. It produces a, an obedient heart. It produces a heart that says, Lord, what would you have me to do? Lord, don't let me grieve you. Uh, we, we say to the, the Holy Spirit, oh, Spirit, don't let me grieve thee. Don't let me have things in my life that would bring a grievance to thee, you see. So when we look, as we look into the, the beginning of this, of this Romans, let me encourage you to lumbano, remember that word again? To receive or seize or grasp or take that that you've been given. It's given. We must receive it. Uh, someone said recently they were shocked at the lack of Bible knowledge within the church today. A very much lack of just simple, what we would, they're not simple truths, but yet they are just truths. Truths of what, and I, I'm guilty of not maybe uh, uh, hammering these into my grandchildren and maybe asking them, what do you have in the Lord Jesus Christ? What do you know that you have? What is yours? You're, you're a believer, then what, do you, what does that mean? What does that mean you're a believer? What do you have? Can you give me a list? Can you give me a list of your inheritance in Christ? It, you see, ask yourself that. What could you write down? What could you write down that you've been given? In Him, through Him. Well, I've been forgiven. What else? And see, what it does, it stirs your mind and stirs your heart. So you will be able to not only, look, it's not about, like I said before, it's not about an argument. It's about your peace. It's about your contentment. It's about your joy. It's about your patience. It's about facing the days ahead with confidence, knowing that we have to have, I, I, I don't have to fear. I don't have to fear because he holds me in his hand. I don't, tonight when I go to sleep, like the preacher said today, I heard him, he said, I can pray before I go to bed because I know he's not going to bed. Isn't that good? He's not. I can go to sleep because he's not. And then so will you. See? Does anyone have a thought? Remember, lumbano or embrace or receive with the hand, so to speak. It, it could be uh, figuratively as you would take something from that. Brother Chris, give me some. I take it, see? It's the same thing spiritually, so to speak. We spiritually, we take that that has been freely given us from God and embrace it. it. It means to embrace it. Embrace these truths. Embrace this, uh, when, when we read uh, redemption, we have redemption through his blood. What does that mean? What does redemption mean? What does it mean to be redeemed? Can I lose it? Is it one time? You see, there's so many things uh, that, you, there's, that we can embrace and grasp and learn and, and love and cherish him more and more each day. Any thought? Well, if not, we'll pray. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for these truths that you've given us. Lord, you, I ask you to help us, Lord, with all of our heart to embrace these truths that we just simply overlook at times. Lord, I'm guilty. Lord, I, I, I so many things my eyes behold. Instead of beholding the truths of your word, the deep, treasures of your word. Lord, your scripture said you've magnified your word above all your name. Lord, if that's the truth of it, and we know it is, why don't we embrace it more? Help us, Lord, to be more diligent. Oh, God, help us to reach and grasp those things that you've so bestowed on us so freely. And so by your grace and by your mercy, you've had mercy on us, Lord. 
Oh, Lord Jesus, help us to love you. Help us, Father. Take us by the hand and lead us and strengthen us, Lord, in the depths of your truth and your depths of your word. Take these young people, Lord, as they go to camp. Overshadow them, Lord. Embrace them with your truth. Lord, never let them be shaken. Lord, I pray that you'll raise them up at anchor. Anchor their soul, Lord. Anchor their soul so deep, Lord, that their, their enemy could not shake them. We ask you, Lord, to protect them. Oh, Jesus, you've promised, Lord. Lord, in these days that are ahead, if, we, if, we don't, if you don't embrace us, Lord, we can't even endure these things, oh God. But, but Lord, we can do all things through you. You've said it in your word, and we thank you for it. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.